Welcome, hello, welcome to Grad School Life by PhD Balance, a brand new show where we speak to grad students about the behind the scenes day to day lives in their programs. I'm your host, Linda Corcoran, and I'm currently finishing up my master's in food science in Ireland. For PhD Balance, I'm a grad chat lead and a Twitter coordinator. I'm super excited to welcome our guest today, Brittany Hawkey. Um, Brittany is a third year PhD candidate in material science and engineering at Penn State University. She previously got her master's in material science and engineering from Arizona State University and her BA in physics and studio art at a small liberal arts school called Coe College. Um, welcome, Brittany. How are you? Hi, I'm good. I'm uh, excited to be, to be here and talk about what my PhD journey has been like. Awesome. Thank you so much for being a guest. We're super excited to have you. Um, so I guess to start, why, where are, well, I said you're in Penn State, but um, where are you at in your, in your program? Early, beginning, late? I'm basically in the middle right now. So over the summer of last year, so summer of 2021, I took my candidacy exam and passed that. So right now I'm basically, I'm done with classes. I've been done with classes for a while now, thankfully. And I'm just working on research, basically trying to get enough to go and do my comprehensive exam. And for our program, we, I feel like this is different for every program, like when they decide you're a candidate, but most of our students say that they become a candidate after passing our, our qualification or candidacy exam, which is the first one, because for us, that is considered the hardest of the two between qualifications and comprehensive, if that makes sense. Sure, sure. I, I know this is different everywhere. So like some people mm -hmm. only have like one exam, and then some people have two, and then some people don't have any. I'm completely far into all this because I'm in mm -hmm. Europe and don't have exams yeah um, I heard about that I'm jealous <laughs> but um amazing congratulations on passing your exam thank you it was incredibly stressful wow and I think it's weird because every place does it differently too yeah it's 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 very weird seeing it as as an outsider and being like this is a very different system to what I'm in <laughs> mm-hmm but I guess to bring it all the way back, why did you decide to apply to grad school in the first place? And what did you think it was going to be like? I know those are two very loaded mm -hmm. questions. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. I think for me, the moment I knew I wanted to go to grad school was when I went to, it was an undergrad. I was going to my first like big academic conference in my field and I was giving a poster presentation and I just loved talking to the other people about my research so much that I was like, well, I guess I should probably go get a PhD so I can keep doing research and talking with people about what I'm doing and stuff like that. I think that was because before that, I had kind of always thought about it in my, my program, even though it was really small. Most students did go on to grad school. So that was kind of always something I thought about, but I think that was the moment that I was like, okay, I think this is why I actually need to go and get a PhD. And for as in terms of what I thought it was going to be like, I knew it was going to be challenging. Uh, I specifically picked to transition to material science and engineering because that was where my research was, even though I was in a physics department in undergrad, and also to be frankly honest I didn't want to take the physics GRE <laughs> or go to a physics grad school um I feel like you hear a lot of horror stories about physics PhDs taking six or seven years and mm -hmm. I just didn't I don't know I just didn't want to go through that I mean that's totally fair <laughs> and you you're you're happy where you are now <laughs> and that's the main thing I am happy now yeah it was it was a windy road to get here but I'm very happy where I am right now mm -hmm. awesome so like this is your second time in grad school um you did your master's yes. first <laughs> so that yeah. was a, that was a slightly 
different, but you basically you love what you're doing now. So that's the main thing. Mm-hmm. Yep. And I guess our main question is, what is your day to day look like? Mm-hmm. So especially since the pandemic, my I feel like my day to days can be incredibly different. They all generally I'm always going to be do, doing the same things. But depending on what day it is, I might be doing something different. But usually they evolve around going into the lab and working on experiments. I'm an experimentalist first, so I prefer to be in the lab. Uh, However, my PI has me getting more into computational stuff. So right now I'm trying to balance working on that versus going into the lab. Mm. And I'm also working on a literature review right now. So I'm also trying to fit in how to do that. Uh, I'm the lab safety manager of my group. So the past two weeks, actually, I spent almost all of my time in the lab working on a chemical inventory. So Uh I just finished yesterday. So that's, that's, that's really interesting. Um, So that lab work, congratulations on finishing that because I imagine that is just so much. (laughs) Oh yeah. We also have a lot of chemicals that we probably don't need. So that's the next step is going to be figuring Mm -hmm. out how and what I can get rid of. Very fair. And academics don't like to get rid of anything. Right. Like part of the issue is I think we inherited a bunch of chemicals from the previous person who was doing research in our same area. Uh, you know, because it's like just in case you're going to need this really obscure rare earth material, at least we have it. Does it matter that it's like 30 years old? Probably. <laughs> that's really fun. Um, well, no, that's not fun. That's not fun at all. <laughs> I, it's It was kind of fun to see just what we had, but mm. having to, I just felt really bad because I was, I was doing this and it's really important, but I, I had my one-on-one with my PI and I was like, so I don't really have anything to update you on because I've either been in meetings or have been doing this every time I've been in the lab. So sorry, but my PI is really understanding about that stuff. So he was like, no, that's totally fine. And I understand this is really like tedious job, but it's very important. So I'm glad that you're doing it. Yeah, I like, I don't know what your lab looks like, but I'm just imagining you pulling chemicals out of like dusty cupboards. (laughs) At least the cupboard. So we have, we, our lab space is split into two. Um, So I work in the area of material science I work in, we do glass research. So we have one lab that is basically relegated to making the glass and so there's a lot of furnaces and equipment in there and so we have like one big cabinet full of chemicals in there which is where we do most of our glass batching but then we have a shared lab on another floor and it's basically just like this giant open space that a bunch of different groups share and so there we had a more chemicals just kind of hiding the ones that aren't used as much like the in case we need this but probably we're just going to forget that they're there until we have to do the chemical inventory every year. So that was by far the most painful one. <laughs> that, that seems, yeah. Yeah, I can imagine that. I have object permanence issues, permanence issues. So um, same. <laughs> <laughs> I can just imagine being like lifting something up and it's like, oh, it's a chemical. Great. <laughs> yep. At least they were they were in drawers that were labeled. Okay. Um, but then but since they were originally labeled, some things got moved. So I would I was originally going through one drawer and I was finding all these chemicals listed that weren't in that drawer. So then I had to go dig through the other cabinet and figure out if they were in there instead. Oh, that that is no wonder it took you two weeks. Yeah, it wasn't like two weeks straight of working but I know but basically yeah going in doing a couple hours and then taking a day off because I had meetings like all day yeah type of thing still like you wouldn't that's a lot sorry I will get off this topic now no it's Um, okay (laughs) I really was just like honing in on that (laughs) um but yeah so I guess what do your days look like when you're not taking chemical inventory (laughs) right yeah so 
usually I have probably not usually, but maybe one or two days a week, I'll have meetings either we have our group meetings every other week on Mondays, uh, or I'll have my one on one with my advisor, we meet once a week usually, or I'll have meetings for I'm helping plan a physics conference. And so Ooh. that's where a lot of my other meetings come from. And then hopefully those only take maybe like an hour or two a day out of my time. And then the rest of the time is going into the lab, either trying to uh, work on batching glass that we're eventually gonna melt or running experiments, or I am working on computational stuff or my literature review. That's very fair. That's a lot of variety. Yeah, um, I'm also, something that's new for me right now is my group is working with a, a collaboration uh, with a group at UC Davis and we have beam time at Slack actually coming up next weekend uh, when we record this. So that's been something very interesting as we've had more meetings for that and trying to figure out how to help them remotely. Cause originally we were gonna go fly out there but since COVID has gotten so much worse we decided it would be safer to just help them remotely. That's very fair. I think um, one thing that surprises a lot of people is the amount of meetings that you can have. And I know mm -hmm. it can vary, um, but what is your meeting to other work ratio like? So this week in particular, it was bad. <laughs> I had a lot of meetings this week. Usually it's probably, I would say like 15% meetings and the rest of the time I'm getting work done. This week I had almost every meeting I could possibly have for the conference was scheduled this week. And then one of, that, one of them got pushed to next week. So that in of itself is like four or five meetings. Um, but then I was also doing a little bit of extra work with another group on campus. So that was another meeting. So I feel like this week, was just bad because of having to do all the lab stuff and then have meetings. Like, I don't, I got like no research done this week. I think it happens. Like we, we expect, like obviously research is a big amount of our time, but it's not all of our time. It's, right. we have so many other things going on as graduate students. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess outside of your work, can you tell us um, things that give your PhD life balance? Yes, I feel like sometimes I have too many outside interests and it's hard to balance those. But the nice thing is I always find something every day to do that's outside of my research or my meetings and stuff like that. So in my free time, I've gotten into rock climbing pretty recently, like that was maybe a year ago. And I also like to do weightlifting. Those are my two big like stress relief things. That's and great. I'm also, sorry, no, you're good. I'm also an artist. So I dabble with a lot of different mediums. Recently, I've gotten back into photography. I took a class on making chainmail bracelets a couple months ago. And I'm hoping to get back into throwing pottery on the wheel. I finally found a space that has um, wheels and clay and stuff like that for pretty cheap. So I'm excited to get back into that. Very cool. That's great. I love when I see people with loads of hobbies because I think at one point in grad school, I had like none and I'm like, mm -hmm. I had to get them back. <laughs> right. Yeah. I feel like at my previous program, I was just so tired all the time that whenever I had free time, it was basically just like watching shows or YouTube and stuff like that, which I still do some of now, but now I'm also I like to play video games. I play board games with friends. I'm finally getting back into reading more consistently. So it's just been really nice to be more conscious about my mental health and setting boundaries for being able to do stuff. Like because I spent so much time this week in meetings and doing the chemical inventory, I decided today that like once this is over, I'm going to just take the rest of the day off. Good for you. That's just, that's the right thing to do. You deserve it. <laughs> yeah, I was just so, I got back yesterday. I was so tired. I had a, an evening meeting at like seven. And after that, I was just like, man, I'm really tired. I'm gonna take the day off tomorrow. <laughs> I mean, you did the extra time. So now it needs to be paid back. <laughs> yep. 
Okay, so I guess before we wrap up, um, what do you want to do next? If that is a like good the, question. <laughs> it's, a, it's a dreaded question, but something I do think about a lot. I, I think I'm fortunate that I could see myself doing a lot of different things after this. I think the most obvious thing would be to go work in industry somewhere doing research. Um, I've thought long and hard about whether I want to stay in academia and I don't, I need a, I need a break. Um, maybe at some point in the future, I can talk about this on another one of your podcasts, or I talked about this on the Dear Student or Dear Grad Student podcast with Alana about what happened at my previous institution. I had a really negative experience, um, but I think that really kind of turned me off staying in academia. So I definitely want to consider either going into industry to do research or working at a, a member society related to physics or material science, something like that. I could also see myself doing more like science writing, something like that. So there's a lot of different options that I have thought about. And I think it, we'll just have to see what is open and what I'm feeling when I graduate. That's very fair. Keep your options open. And because there right. are so many. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you seem like you have so many interests. So that's always great. <laughs> yeah. So um, I guess... One last question is, where can our listeners find you? Yes, so I am on Twitter, Instagram, and recently TikTok. My handle for all three of those is super Spartacle. So it's super S particle, all like one word. Um, that's a, a nerdy physics throwback to when I used to do Science Olympiad in like eighth grade. But I also have a art Instagram that you can find, I think it's artistically scientific. That's where I try to post most of my art. I'm not good at posting frequently. Um, but yeah, those are the main places where I'm at. That's awesome. Um, that's great. And I'm definitely gonna check out your art because I love, <laughs> <Thanks. laughs> love art. <laughs> right now it's mostly photography, but hopefully as I get back on the wheel some more, I'll post more of the ceramics and stuff that I'm making. Awesome lots of variety so um mm. thank you so much Brittany for joining us um thanks to everyone for listening this has been grad school life by phd balance episodes are posted every second thursday on youtube and all major streaming platforms to find our podcast you can just search grad school life on spotify apple podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcasts and don't forget to subscribe on your chosen platform to get notifications about new episodes until next time bye and take care of yourself